Well, I would. I don't know about you. Had eyes like mine. <laughs> you couldn't take all the blood and gore. Oh, yeah, it made me feel sick. But thank God I remembered what it said in my first aid manual for nausea. Put the head between the legs. Yes, John, but you're supposed to put your head between your own legs. It's been a journey that's given us many memorable moments and created stars and celebrities that have become household names. Now, if you're like me, there's nothing better than switching on the old telly and finding someone who can give you a good laugh. Well, over the next two hours, we're going to be paying tribute to the people who've done just that, right from the very beginning up until the present. In 1957, it all started here at GDV Channel 9 in Melbourne for a man who came to be known as the king of Australian television, Graham Kennedy. And now, here's Graham! another one of those. Ready? <laughs> the count of three, gentlemen. One, two, three. I've had enough. I've been attacked, and that's only a little bit of it. That's that's just this year. 
that that happened. There's been nine years of that. So I'm having written in my next contract, it will be there, a clause. Thou shalt not blow him up <laughs> or drop stuff on him from a great height. <laughs> and that's final. Go for a rehearsal. Well, I'm sorry, I've been standing outside a cake shop for half an hour. What for? There was a tart upside down in the window. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Come back. <laughs> I don't need the money, son. <laughs> Graham Kennedy became one of the first big stars on Australian television with his own brand of cheeky and irreverent humour. At a time when overseas programs were flooding our airwaves, he proved that Australian TV was just as good, if not better. And to this day, he's still regarded as not only a great Australian TV entertainer, but one of the best the world has seen. And riding alongside of Graham was a cast of performers who also became stars in their own right. Oh, Quasimodo, you and Esmeralda are good friends, yes? Yeah? No, more than... <laughs> more than good friends. More than She good fell friends. in love with me at first sight. Really? I suppose my manly beauty overwhelmed her. She was your first love? Yes, up to then I'd be the hunchback with not a dame. <laughs> One of the most talented men I have ever come across in my life in the theatre or the theatrical profession because he is so inventive, he is so quick, he's got very, very quick wit and he would take a sketch, if it was a dreadful sketch, and he would do things which made it funny. You must not marry him, Juliet. Juliet? Yeah. Ah! There were all sorts of uh, things happening because, uh, you know, it was all new to us. So every now and again somebody would forget a line and you'd be trying to prompt them out of the corner of your mouth or something. And sometimes you'd be near hysteria. Now sit down and have your private colic phone. Have me what? Private colic phone. Prime <laughs> what are you talking about, George? That's spaghetti, isn't it? It's Italian for breakfast, George. I bet it's in the paper. Prime Accolade. And I cooked that lovely spaghetti in honour of that Italian president that's coming to visit us. Is the Italian president coming to visit us? Mm -hmm. I'd better put on my coat then. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Because they were basically ad-lib, um, I think part of the fun was that people knew they were just that and that anything could happen. And given the restraints of the 50s and 60s, uh, usually almost anything did happen. I mean, I dropped all my dinner frightened hell out of me. <laughs> Pick up my dinner. <coughs> Your Majesty. Pick it up again. King is talking! If you don't pick that up, Bert, you won't be in the next series. <laughs> Bert and Graham played contestants trying to make each other laugh. Now, the whole idea of the thing was not to laugh. There were pies in the face. There was soup thrown down the front of beautiful dinner suits. It sounds disgraceful, but when you see it, even today, it actually is magic. It comes alive, loaded with laughs. He's handling those crushed nuts brilliantly, Bob. <laughs> There's the inevitable cherry, brilliantly done. <laughs> Graham Kennedy made In Melbourne Tonight one of the most successful and longest running shows of its time, lasting over 13 years. But in the beginning there was doubt as to whether he'd be the right man for the job. You see, in those days the main sponsors would advertise their products during the show and none of them thought that he was a good enough salesman. Well, he soon proved them wrong with his unique brand of advertising that sent sales sky high. <laughs> Delicious here. This is pal dog food. Uh, Rover Darling. Oh, hello. He's... Rover? Oh, he's.
Uh, ladies, you, uh, you obviously know what is going on. <laughs> it's just that it's going on for so long. Uh, good evening. Oh, we'd like to say that it's, um, it's, um... Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here. You see, because it's not very often that we, uh, uh, uh... Oh, yeah, that we get the opportunity to work with such a wonderful group. Quick, there's a message coming in the wireless. Take the sound, take the sound. Okay, what does it say? What does it say? Oh. By the 1960s, Graham Kennedy was undoubtedly the biggest celebrity on Australian television, but he was identified mainly with Melbourne, and so the search was on for a similar personality to host a show for the Sydney market. An American by the name of Morton Isaacson was booked as a stand-in host for Sydney's Tonight Show, but he soon became a permanent fixture and a household name as Don Lane, the lanky yank. It was wonderful days of television and we did split screen television between two cities and everybody thought that was outstanding. I mean today, you know, we zap by satellite to somewhere else. Welcome to Playboy Mansion West. You want me here a long time or just half a mo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you put other leg over yonder. Now, through there. <laughs> now we start. Okay, you know what to say, don't you? <laughs> Throughout their careers, both Kennedy and Lane chose one main man to be their sidekick. With his quick wit, Bert Newton was the ideal variety show partner. Now, he, of course, went on to achieve great solo success in the television industry, due in part to his ability to adapt to any situation. Michael, we're pretty thrilled. This is the very first time that um, a guest star for the Logies has come back the second time. And definitely you're quite thrilled to come back for us. Yeah. <laughs> As, um, do we have to do any more of those? No. You wouldn't know Vic Morrow at all, would you? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, really, I really didn't know it. I really didn't know it. This, this was going to happen. And um, I have an affliction. It's called emotion. And uh... Oh, shit. Congratulations, man. You have a child? But that, out of wedlock? Right, yes, quite. Is he still living? He's 27 years old now. And obviously, he would have to be for the, the plot of homosexual, is he? Yes. Yeah. Oh, is he? Oh, yes. <laughs> is he really? Is he? I like the boy. <laughs> Did you say Roy or Boy? I like the boy. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Roy. Yeah. Well, hey, hang on, hang on. No. I'll change religion. I'll do anything for it. I don't care. Everything for me, anyway, in the <clears throat> the first, oh, I suppose, five, six, seven years was always live. And that's why I've always had a very soft spot for live television. There's something about it. Um, it's that uh, expectancy, which is felt not only by the performer but also by the audience unfortunately i think it's something which is dying slowly but surely and i think that's a great tragedy because we may get to the stage where we won't have production people and indeed artists who are able to work live simply because they've never been asked to do so before and there is a there's a special quality about live television i'm gonna fire right over there yeah it is gonna ricochet six times you got it 
Have I? Yeah. <laughs> Does it hurt much? No. <laughs> Don't give it to me. <laughs> no, no. Okay. You have it in Korea? No, yeah, anyway, I did. I'm going to fire up six ricochets. You're right to go. Yeah, okay. Here. Okay. Right. Here we go. Right. <laughs> Hey, Any foot cry supporters here, right? Eh? No, no. Not us cries. <laughs> no. Didn't I just talk to you? Aye, aye, Paula. <laughs> I want to marry you tonight. Are you sure you're okay? Are you, are you all right? <laughs> what? 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 This way, I've got plans. The Don Lane Show era was a very interesting one. I, I think it was probably the best gig I've ever done, simply because I had Count Blanche. I don't mean total control. I mean just the, um, the ticket to be able to get on and do what I, I do best. Um, we got into a formula pretty early in the piece that on chosen occasions, if we had a famous guest in, I would then do the wheel later in the show, uh, doing a send-up of that person. Demis Roussos was, was one of them. Amazing success stories in the history of Australian television is that of Paul Hogan, a rigger on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. He set out to prove that anyone can become famous. His unique style of ocker humour saw him graduate from Talent Quest entrant to television show host to international film star. And that's because the Hogue style of humour works on anyone, even the royal family. Just, just mind little William for me, okay? Just if, if he wakes up, give him some of that kangaroo mince. <laughs> well, we'll give him a drink. Oh, not out of a can. <laughs> Uncle Paul will be back in a minute. 
Well, if you can't trust hoes with your kids, who can you trust? <laughs> Viewers, ladies and gentlemen of all walks of life, <laughs> one of the greatest links between Australia, our mighty sun-drenched continent, and England, a little damp place up north, is the game of cricket. Now I have brought along tonight a recently inherited family heirloom, which I believe is probably the greatest symbol of that link in existence. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the original cricket ashes. <laughs> no, not, the, uh, not the ones we just thrashed the palms and won back off them. They're only a hundred years old. These are the original cricket ashes and as such are a priceless treasure. Now it's my intention to donate these ashes to a, shall we say, suitable representative of the British people <laughs> for safekeeping in the Tower of London, where they keep all their good stuff, you know. <laughs> now I'm not doing this, you're asking why is he doing it, I'm not doing this for personal glory. Although it has got a nice ring to it, hasn't it? <laughs> Sir Hoags. Now it's just that I believe that this priceless relic belongs in the Tower of London and when I tell you the history of it, these original cricket ashes, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Firstly, uh, does anyone here tonight know exactly when the game of cricket was inv invented and by whom? Nobody? Good. <laughs> cricket, your cricket was actually invented in 1648 in England and it was invented by the then reigning monarch, King Charles I. Let me tell you a few things about King Charles I. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Listen, um, viewers, you know me, I'm not one to speak ill of the dead, you know. But the man died 350 years ago, 13,000 miles from here, and the prospect of him having a relative within earshot Just in case anyone related to King Charles I, shove your hand up. <laughs> no one? Good. <clears throat> King Charles I was undoubtedly... Um, <laughs> no. Well, he was a hell of a good bloke, actually. <laughs> that um, during his reign, you see, there was no organised sport in England, as we know it. No cricket. The nearest thing they had to it was public execution. <laughs> no, no, every Saturday they used to bundle all these wicked wretches into the square and lop their heads off. And the, you know, the crowd would roll up with an esky full of coldies and <laughs> a bit of zinc on the nose and <laughs> cheer for their favourite executioners. <laughs> Bow fum! Bow fum! <laughs> yeah. But you see, beheading as a sport had been going on for a long time in England and this worried King Charles, mainly because the attendances were falling. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the gate takings were down, the t-shirts weren't selling. <laughs> I think basically it was a case of uh, people getting bored with a sport where the scoreboard was always roughly the same. Executioners 47, wretches nil. Right. Now, Charles, to his credit, he tried to brighten it up as a spectacle. He even brought in uh, this Scottish entrepreneur, uh, McCarran McPacker. <laughs> and he, he, what he did, he, he thought, well, we'll put the executions on at night. <laughs> you know, night beheading under lights. <laughs> and he even, uh, even dressed the uh, executioners up in brightly coloured uniforms, you know, <laughs> instead of the traditional black. Hired half a dozen ex axe men and put them up in a commentary box. <laughs> you know, to sort of let people know what's happening. You know, it's Lily coming in off the short run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he even 
tried using a white axe. <laughs> but um, didn't really work. I think uh, in the 17th century, flood lighting probably left a lot to be desired. <laughs> so finally, in desperation, King Charles turned to his chief advisor. And here's the Australian connection. A gentleman by the name of Sir Walter Hogan, <laughs> an ancestor. Now, just as Queen Elizabeth sent Sir Walter Raleigh over to America and he came back with a ship full of tobacco, well, Charles had earlier sent Sir Walter Hogan to America, unfortunately landed in California, and come back with a ship full of marijuana. <laughs> Actually, Sir Walter's often seen in paintings of that period in the court. He's the one standing in the background with the long clay pipe and the dopey smile on his face. <laughs> anyway, Sir Walter, or Dopey Wall as he was known around the court, <laughs> said to King Charles, Hey, listen, Chuck baby. When I was coming back from the States, I called into India. From America to England via India. Obviously, Sir Walter's navigator had been sampling the cargo as well. <laughs> but he said, over there, they execute their bad eggs by bundling them into the town square, and they invite all the townspeople to chuck bricks at them. They call it stoning. It's very popular. And Charles thought, that's the answer. Audience participation. <laughs> so the following Saturday, they bundled all these poor wretches into the city square and invited the mob to chuck bricks at them. Went over like a house on fire. I mean, within minutes, it looked just like the hill at the Sydney cricket ground. <laughs> and suddenly, into the square, strode a man of the cloth, a young chaplain from nearby Westminster Abbey. And he jumped out in front of the mob and said, stop, stop, hey, come on, fair suck of the sauce bottle, hey, hey. <laughs> and the mob said, you know, get out of the way. They're wicked wretches, they deserve to die. And he said, this chaplain said, I know they're wicked, but they're my flock, they're my wicked, and I must defend them. And with that, picked up a lump of 4B2 and started hitting the stones back. No. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't get ahead of me. You're not that clever, are you? Must have taken the chewing gum out to think that quick. No. And just then, another young man who had lodgings with this chaplain, lived in his boarding house, come running out of the crowd, picked up a lump of 4B2, and he helped him. And the two of them stood there knocking these stones back. Well, the next day, there appeared in the paper which incidentally was published by Sir Walter Hogan under his non de plume, Rupert Hogan. <laughs> now there appeared a portrait of this fantastic happening at the stoning. And beneath it, the caption, which was to become the world's first cricket headline. And nobody knew the name of this young chaplain, nor of the young man that lived in his boarding house. So the caption simply read, Chaplain and Boarder Defending Their Wicked. <laughs> So ashamed. <laughs> anyway, King Charles, to his everlasting credit, was so disgusted with that dreadful pun that the next Saturday he had Sir Walter Hogan burnt at the stake and there he is, the original cricket ashes. <laughs>
There was never any gurus right from when I started on television in 72. There was never any wise old man that you could go to and say, is this funny? Will this work? Should I do this? You just did what was in your gut. You know, there was no comedy school or entertainment school or anything like that. You just did what you felt would make people laugh or make them happy or entertain them. And Viewers, it's no use. I can't go on with these frivolities. Not while the whole country's in terrible danger. Someone's got to say it. Television is not a harmless toy. It is a powerful, evil force. And we're all in danger from it right now. That's right. Don't try and stop me. You see, viewers, the problem, the danger is that television goes through the air. As you know, not through the wires, love. Give yourself away. As you know, television is pumped out into the airwaves by the channels. And your antenna plucks it out of the air and translates it onto your screen. Now, because there are several million viewers out there, they pump out several million copies of every program. <laughs> so if we all want to watch, say, 60 minutes, everyone gets a good picture, right? Works out pretty well. But what about the television duds? The turkeys that no one wants to watch. Millions of copies of those turkeys being pumped out into the air and only a handful of them being picked up by viewers. <laughs> Have you ever thought, where do all those turkeys go? <laughs> they don't just vanish, you know. Matter is perpetual, they're still out there now. And viewers, I know where they are. Just think for a minute, what is the most effective household device, common device for picking up a television picture? The best makeshift aerial. <laughs> the wire coat hanger. At this very moment, in every home, in every wardrobe. It's not too deep for you, is it? These little buggers are hanging there. Trying to look innocent. While quietly and efficiently sucking from the airwaves. Countless thousands of hours of diabolical TV rubbish. <laughs> I'm waiting, just waiting for that dark night when you open that wardrobe door. <laughs> and 25 years of diabolical TV garbage <laughs> will come flooding out. <laughs> Viewers, wherever you're watching, it's not too late. I want you to get up out of your chairs. Go out to your wardrobes. <laughs> Rip all these devilish hangers out and mangle them. Destroy them before they destroy you. That's all I can say. <laughs> Save yourselves for it's too late. Comedy and variety programs have played a great part in forming the image of Australian TV over the past 40 years, from early shows like IMT through to the Paul Hogan show, and still today, shows like Hey Hey It's Saturday enjoy great success. But where did it all start? Who was the first person to host a national variety comedy program in Australia? Well, the answer is a man who's been in the entertainment industry for over 50 years, and by his side for most of that time was his wife, Bobby Lim and the brilliant Dawn Lake. Lucky I don't have to get me hair cut. <laughs> you know why I don't have to get me hair cut anymore? Uh, oh, well, if it gets a bit long now with all that hair lacquer, I just snap a bit off. <laughs> <laughs> I love how's your romance going? No good. I broke it off last week. He bought me a ring with five stones in it. Five stones? Did he not? Yes, he couldn't afford diamonds. <laughs> five stones. Bricks, they were. I was walking around like this. <laughs> Mind you, not much chop. He's in jail now, you know. Is he? Oh, Lottie, what did his mother say? She said, Hello, son, what are you doing here? <laughs> Funny family. I've known them for years. Mind you, they're strange. Very strange. <laughs> Your younger sister's a funny girl. Is she? You know, when she was younger, she was a real tomboy. They even looked like a boy. <laughs> Did she? Mind you, she doesn't look like a boy now. No? No. She looks more like a man. Funny <laughs> family, huh? Yes, strange, very strange. <laughs> oh, well, good riddance to bad.
bad rap. He says, but I was a good riddance, good riddance. I say, how's your romance going? Oh, all right. But I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, he keeps saying he respects me. <laughs> Uh-oh. Keeps saying he wants to put me on a pedestal. Oh, look, you've got to be careful. <laughs> you know that girl who used to work in the cloakroom? You mean the one with the pink fluorescent lighting? Yeah, that's the same. <laughs> same Sheila. Oh, yeah. And that fella who wanted to put her up on a pedestal? Yeah. Well, that was two years ago. Oh, Lottie, tell me what happened. Well, she's still up on a pedestal, and he's up in Queensland married to a sister. <laughs> We've had George Wallace and uh, Roy Reed and all these comedians. And Buster was from that school, from the vaudeville school. But he had this face and uh, it was such magic face. And you know what we used to do? We used to have a loose camera, we called it. We'd have three cameras plus a fourth one. And that fourth one would always be on Buster because of this fantastic, ugly face of his. He could look into the camera with a face, just, it was his camera. So he knew for a reaction shot, he would just, Look at him, his camera, basically, and it worked beautifully. Hello, Mum. <laughs> now, the owl isn't home yet. <laughs> what am I doing? What am I always doing at seven in the morning? Getting your son's dinner. <laughs> You'll be home in a few minutes. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean I should be thankful? I got a husband that comes straight home after work. Where else is he gonna go at seven in the morning? <laughs> Look, Mom, I don't want to complain, but he's been on the night shift for 16 years. <laughs> what war effort? <laughs> it's over. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> I loved it. I'm very blessed here because I've been in a job that I love for 50 years, you know, not too many people can say that. And you know what, I was only saying the other day, to be in this business, I have to celebrate this year 50 years in show business, professionally, and I have never yet met one person that knows everything about it, particularly comedy. All right, could you tell me, Harry, in what year was the uh, Battle of Hastings fought? 1065. 1065. 1065. Well, now, just a minute. Uh, are you sure? Because what I got here, I've got on here. No, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Sure. You know, I'm sorry, sorry. I think you're wrong, Harry. So you're out. No. Because the answer is... Yeah, you're, you're going to say 1066, but I can assure you that you're wrong. I, I happen to know it's 1065. <laughs> yeah, but just a minute. <laughs> Uh, just a minute there, Harry. Uh, uh, it's on my card here, you know. Yeah, well, I know. Well, cards, cards can sometimes be wrong, you know. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, so I know. But we get our we get our answers here, you know, all customers. We get our answers here from uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, well, the Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica sometimes wrong. But I, ha I have to know that I'm teaching this at the very moment. I'm teaching this period, and I can tell you that the, the Battle of Hastings started at five minutes to midnight on December the thirty first, ten sixty five. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, well, you could be wrong because on my card here it says. Yeah, well, 10 the card's no good at all. I mean, we don't. Want to <laughs> And King Harold got shot in the eye in 1065. No, just a minute, Harry. Look, just before. Uh, no, just, Harry, look, I'm afraid you're wrong. No, I, I, I can tell you that I'm right. That's the battle of Hastings. Well, Harry, don't mind. Harry! 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 It turned Barry Humphreys into the mother of Australian television, the most royal Dame Edna Everidge. The last thing in the world I'd like to do is to upset you in any way, but I'm just wondering if tonight uh, a television set has been placed strategically in a hospital ward here in Melbourne for you to say hello to your beloved husband, who of course has not been seen publicly now for many, many years. 
Well, I'm afraid Norm is dead, darling. He's... He... Please, that's terribly tasteless. He... Oh, Bert, that's sickening, isn't it? He's dead to the world oh, at the I moment, see. I'm afraid. He's, com- he's heavily sedated. Mm-hmm. They wanted to bring him here, but I think his... His technology would probably interfere, wouldn't it, with yours? Yeah. But I must say that this show is being watched by my wonderful mother in a maximum security twilight home. Isn't that marvellous? It is. It is, Bert. She's watching it on the only twilight home in the southern hemisphere with an electric fence. She is. But I don't appear much on the box here, do I? It's a pity, but I'm a bit overwhelming, aren't I, Bert? Let's I, I don't think so at all. I'm a little bit overwhelming. Not for me. Uh, when I was born, my mother said to the doctor, what is it? He said, I'm afraid it's overwhelming. He did. <laughs> but I can't help it. I'm a person. You know, I'm just a person. Success hasn't affected you, Dame Edna, at all. No, I don't think it has. I'm a very, very natural person underneath this... <laughs> The only difference between me and these people is that I'm rich and talented and they're not. That's about all. But that doesn't apply to all of them. No. no. I was brought up in Wagga Wagga, so in, in a spooky way. I'm a New South Wales woman, really. But then we went to Melbourne, where my father became an Electrolux salesman. <laughs> he was the first of the friendly Electrolux men, as a matter of fact. This is the door-to-door and, salesman, uh, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And they used to particularly specialise in the optional extras, the attachments. (laughs) As a matter of fact, my husband pioneered the crevice nozzle. The crevice nozzle, eh? The crevice nozzle. Yes, you fit it onto the onto the end of your electrux and you can do pretty well anything with it. You can get into those nooks and crannies. Which is so important, isn't it, in in the home, particularly when everyone's gone to work. Be that, it had a couple of Valium. Be that as it may, um, and the cooler bar cask, of course, hadn't been invented in those days. Be that as it may, we went back to Wagga Wagga, my mother and I and little Lois. Mummy, I think, wanted to show off my little bubba to some of her old friends there. And we stayed with these people out of town, more or less in the bush. And one night I woke up at about four o'clock in the morning in a panic and I reached for my watch and I'd got the times wrong and Lois always got fed at about one. So I rushed out to the veranda where her little bassinet was and it was empty. It was empty, Ray! (laughs) And... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Satellite. I didn't mean this to happen. Martians. (laughs) However, People, they, of course, the detectives came. They said, we looked everywhere. There was never a sign of her. We never saw her again. But they discovered, they brought Aboriginal trackers and things, and they discovered on the veranda the footprint of a rogue koala. <laughs> and that was the only clue we ever had. I'm still convinced that little, I saw Greystoke. Did you see that? Yes, I did. That lovely documentary. <laughs> and I'm convinced now that Lois is still alive somewhere, up a tree. <laughs> being cared for by a caring koala family. I think it's possible. Barry Humphreys is one of the most versatile comedians this country has ever seen. From the glamorous Dame Edna, he transforms himself into another of his much-loved characters, the not-so-glamorous Sir Les Patterson, who's made a career out of drinking, smoking, bludging, and trying to put television show hosts off air. But it's led to a fashion, you know, people aren't smoking, they're not drinking, they're uh, cutting down on uh, on the odd research assistant, uh, you know, uh, after working hours, getting all this down, darling. Lovely, no worries. She can get it down too, I can tell you. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's after half past six now, isn't it? <laughs> and you this still fella's can... on a desert island with a pig. No. <laughs> No, you can't, you can't tell that one. Oh, no. So, Les, how do you handle fame? I don't have any problems. I like it up there. Being the recognised in the street. It suits me being recognised. People come up to me, they want me to kiss their kids, you know. So, Les, the other question I wanted to ask you was how you handle being a friend of celebrities? Well, what celebrities have you in mind? I, uh, there's quite a few celebrities. Joan Collins is a personal friend of mine. 
She's a beautiful girl, too. She likes perfume, too. You wouldn't guess what she puts behind her ears to attract the men folk. Her ankles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a quarter to seven. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> You're ahead of me, fella. Is this a dry run or is this going straight to air? Are we on delay? That's what I want to know. <laughs> if we're not on delay, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Gary MacDonald is one of Australia's best-known actors, from stage to film to television and the award-winning series Mother and Son. But there's one role he's played and one character he's invented that became an instant legend in the history of Australian television. It's the man from Dapto with the shaving problem, Norman Gunston. Thank you. A ring, a ring, a one and you give. Too kind. I remember once, you know, I was understudying in the school nativity play and I just knew I would have made, I really would have made a much better baby Jesus than, than Kevin Desmond. He used to break one in the manger. You no, know, he did. He got tell the critics pan. It was dreadful. And then we got to go on, but... I'm sorry, I don't want to embarrass you, but you ought to use an electric razor. Mm. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Sally Struthers, from All in the Family. Now, Mrs. Uh, uh, Victorian Premier, Jenkin, I want to know, would you tell the cameras, please, are you totally behind the Salvation Army Food Bank? Absolutely. The Salvation Army do the most wonderful job for people, and they do it in a way that respects the people they deal with. You're running a bit of a risk, but aren't you? Sorry. Right. Well, starting up any sort of bank here in Victoria. Oh, well, the food bank. Well, that's a different issue. Just a bit worried about the, uh, the tricontinental chicken noodle soup scandal. But you're supposed to be supporting them, not oh, putting people I, off. No, I am. I'm supporting them. I just don't want... And with all those medals, you must have yeah, a real I, sense yeah, of integrity. I have, totally. Oh, I've got a lot of affinity yeah. with the army. I was in the KISS army for seven weeks. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing at the zoo today? Well... I suppose that's why you didn't wear polka dots today, eh? Absolutely. Good idea at the zoo. I suppose your polka dots would have been all right if the animals had misbehaved. Might have brought the leopard on heat or anything. <laughs> Oh, now, quick, I need an advisor. Oh, yeah. Or a regional manager. Uh, it's all right. Come to think of it. You guys in Victoria need this. Oh, no, no, no. Unforgettable. That's what you are. Unforgettable, though near or far. What the song of love that clings to me? How the thought of you has things to me never before. Has someone been born? Unforgettable. <laughs> <laughs> and forevermore. And forevermore. That's how you stay. That's how you stay. That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone so, so unforgettable. Thinks they the way unforgettable to It's incredible 
like someone so, so unforgettable Fix them away Unforgettable back to Australian TV's Funniest People. In the 80s, there didn't seem to be a lot to laugh about. That was until actors like Marianne Fay, Mark Mitchell and Glenn Robbins appeared in the comedy company and created characters that became national identities. I am, my name's Collie, and Dino is a fat income, dead set idiot, suck face, mega, deadhead, brain dead liar. And those are his good points. Now, everything he went about me last week is absolute ball. You know, he reckons he's so tough, but guess what? Even I shave more than him, see? <laughs> you know, and he thinks he's so funny. You know, like today in biology, sir goes, you know, what sort of bird can't fly and dinner goes, sir, sir, a roast chicken. <laughs> As if that's funny, you know? And then in English, Miss goes, use a word, um, unaware in a sentence. And then I goes, look up there, look down there, I can see you're unaware. <laughs> so immature, you know? And he is going with my ex-best friend, Natalie. And guess what? She has spread it that I got with at least five other guys and I was going with Dino, which is, boy, there was at least nine. <laughs> you know, and today, me and Amanda, like, we were just doing yo-yos, and um, Amanda goes, you know, can you do walk the dog? And I go, yeah, hey, Nat, you want to come for a walk? <laughs> so funny. Amanda just laughed till her hair fell out of place. <laughs> you know, and Nat goes, what are you staring at? And I go... I don't know, I haven't got a zoo book on me. You know? And then she goes, she's gonna hit me, and I go, oh, duh, I'm really scared. You know? Guess what she does? So it's singing, I put a drawing pin on her set, and she goes, she goes, ah! You know, and she chucks a real speck attack. And Sir goes, Kylie, and I go, ha ha, it wasn't me. And Sir goes, who else would want to do such an immature thing like that to Natalie? And guess what, the whole class puts up their hands. I find that I'm far, more, I'm far happier performing in character. I don't particularly want to be me. I'm not even particularly good at being me. Um, so as soon as I'm given a wig and it's someone else to be, I can go with it and I'm very happy doing that. Um, but the, the people that I tended to be were, were based on probably types that I knew at the time. For instance, I don't drive, um, so I have to take public transport. And being on public transport around about 3.30 in the afternoon, you come across a lot of kids who go to school. Kylie Mole started happening. She goes, Kylie, I think it means she's a really spack idiot. And I go, Lisa, I'm glad you agree with me. <laughs> and she goes, Kylie, you have very bad grammar. And I go, how would you know you have never even met her? <laughs> you know? Bang. And she goes, you know, I have a list of complaints here about you punching kids. And I go, Bob, that was ages ago, like this morning. <laughs> you know, and she goes, I'm writing on your arm. And I go, duh, well, how else am I supposed to pass exams? <laughs> You know, and she goes about lying. According to Mr. Matheson, your grandmother has died six times this year. And I go, yeah, well, she's had a bad year. <laughs> you know, and she goes, there's been complaints from parents that you're a bad influence. And I go, which parents? And she goes, yours. <laughs> Can you believe it? My own parents stopped me in. I am spewing. And she goes, don't you think you are unhealthy influence? Because other kids copy you, you know? And I go, it's better than copying teachers and psychologists. You know, imagine if kids come to school going, you know, oh, there's something I'd like to share with you. Oh, you know, do you think you're being realistic? You know, that would be unhealthy because they get their heads punched in. <laughs> you know, and she goes, Kylie, what happened with the student teacher last week? And I go, nothing. Just every time she sat down, we went, <laughs> And she goes, I suppose you think that's funny. And I go, yeah, we backed up. <laughs> and she goes, I think you better go back to class. So I go, and I wait outside the door, and I watch. And she gets up, and when she sits down, I go, <laughs> You should have seen her face unroll. See ya. Have a guess where I am. That's right, the Melbourne Cup. On the man saying, Where's your ticket? There it is, no worries at all. In you go, he's saying, and have a wonderful day at the Melbourne Cup on the lather. And I was very lucky to get a park right near the track. Wasn't I lucky? Eh? Yes, I was. And I parked the car there and I popped out with my bag and everything, all ready for a marvellous, beautiful day. Yes, I did. And I went straight down to where the horsies are and I'm wandering around there saying hello to the horsies and have a look at the beautiful roses. They smell good and you know why? A bit of fertiliser. That's right. 
So I got out my very special bag and I, what did I do? I put some in that and take it out for my roses. Just my eye, I'm not silly, that's right. And out into the bidding yard we go. Hello there, young girlies, I'm saying howdy doody there, how you going? And I thought I'll go and make a bit of a bet on a horse. I'll set up two bob each way on that one there. And I'll have two bob on that one there. And I'll be in the money, won't I? Oh, yes, I will. I'll have lots and lots of money if I win. And I'm wandering round. I'm looking for Auntie Dawn. I'm looking round. I can't see her. Where are you, Auntie Dawn? So I hopped up there like that. And there was Auntie Dawn over there. There I'm saying, Auntie Dawn, meet me here at 10 to 1. 10 to 1, Auntie Dawn. 10 to 1, Auntie Dawn. <laughs> Come on, the love, you'll need some money on a bit. No worries at all. I'll put that in there and I'll have a bit of a bet later on, won't I? Yeah? And I went out there, all the way right through the gate, right out into the middle there on the grass I was. I went, whoa, look out, and here come the horses. They're coming down the track. They're saying, look out, Uncle Arthur, look out, Uncle Arthur. I mean, I think if you look at the people who actually did our show, people like Mark Mitchell, cheerful, charming Mark Mitchell, um, the characters that Mark did, the Kim's lovely Colin Carpenter character, uh, if you look at all the people involved, they were, um, you know, Russell, Gilbert, Glenn, ordinary folk, nice, ordinary folk. And I actually think they appealed to ordinary folk. It was a ordinary comedy about ordinary people, ordinary strains. And I think that was important. I don't think you could have had a group of people who were not ordinary, pretending to be ordinary, in a bid to catch the ratings. <laughs> anyway, gentlemen, look, you know, summer's coming here again, and I got the beautiful letters for this gentleman. Have a look at that. Wait a minute. This one here. Beautiful. Put him in the water. Come on, nice. Doesn't matter. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'll get you another one, doesn't matter. Because you know, summer's here, and it's the time for salad, beautiful, time for fruits, and Tommy, you'll go to the beach to take it easy. You know, <laughs> my daughter is, Rula, Sula, Tula, Vula, Fula, and a guppy. I teach them all to swim myself. You know, but it's funny. Because when they get down to the beach, they forget everything, you know? And they have to be rescued by the life savers. Sometimes 10, 12 times. <laughs> All except for Agape. Because we know when she's splashing about on the water, waving, waving, waving. You know what they do? They get up and they shift the flags. <laughs> oh, what can you do? <laughs> you know, last year my mother, Aphrodite, she sees one of the lifesavers bending over to give to Sula the mouth-to-mouth -mouth restoration, and she lose her anger. And she hit him with a ball of the totem tennis. Now, I won't tell you where she hit him. But you know the life savers pull the bodies up like this, like that. I tell you, he's not going to be doing that for a while. <laughs> but you know, the trouble with the beach is so many people go to him, it's hard to get a good spot. So you know what we do? We send my mother Aphrodite down to get the spot, you know, down early in September. <laughs> so, and she keeps the spot, you know, and it's easy to find him because he's the only one on the old beach with a black umbrella and black beach towels. Because <laughs> you know, Aphrodite, my mother, he's in mourning, you know? Because there was a death in the family about 26 years ago. <laughs> but you know, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the, thing, the trouble with the beach these days is that too many crazy people going on there, you know, the sun burning down, burning, burning. <laughs> and the brains of the crazy people starts to go flying, you know? And they lose their brains, lose their mind. Because the other day, Marika and me, we were down at the beach, you know? We had the baby sit looking after the little gentleman. We're sitting down at the beach. We're falling asleep in the sun. Sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. Next minute I get woken up by people throwing buckets of water over me. Stand up and over Marika, my wife. Screaming out, keep them wet, keep them cool. They're digging trenches and they're using oars trying to get us back into the sea. Trying to run us back into the water. Crazy, people with their minds all burned up by the sun. Anyway. Doesn't matter, gentlemen. Happy birthday. And good luck to your family.
great comedy teams on Australian television, but when a little guy from Footscray in the western suburbs of Melbourne and a go-go dancer teamed up over 20 years ago, it was to become a relationship that has been one of the most enduring in the history of Australian television. Ernie Sigley and Denise Drysdale have worked together on morning television, primetime shows, and in the beginning they even released a single which went to number one. Hey, hey, Paul, I want to marry you tonight. Hey, hey, Paul, no one else could ever do. I've waited so long for school to be through. Paul, I can't wait no more for you. I think the thing with Denise and I is that neither of us care who gets the laugh uh, as long as someone gets it and neither of us try to be the star and say oh well, I'm better than her or she's better than me. We don't think that way. Uh, we don't mix a lot socially which I think helps neither. I don't think Don and Bert ever mix socially either or Graham and Graham and Bert. Uh, so <coughs> excuse me I'll see her when she comes in and we talk to each other on the phone and that but we're there and we just bounce off each other and uh, I can see she's going to do a line, so I'll play straight to her and let her do the line, and she, she understands the same thing about me, and she'll let me do the line. You don't really what? go to bed like that, do you? Yeah. I put that You'll have to marry a Chinaman. Because <laughs> they've got patience. <laughs> oh, now don't laugh. We're acting. Now, be an actress, right, darling? What's the script say at the end? No, no script. <laughs> no, no, let's play it fitting him. But my darling, <laughs> darling, we've known each other now for four to five months. And every time I meet you and dance with you, I look into your brown eyes and I sincerely think <laughs> that we were meant to be one. Is it possible at some certain stage that you and I could put our electricity together and create little sparks of love. Tell me, my darling. There's only one thing I want to say. And what is that, my darling? Can you see without your glasses? <laughs> No look at Australian TV's funniest people would be complete without mentioning the most successful variety show in the history of Australian television, which this year celebrated its 25th anniversary. Hey, hey, it's Saturday. Live across the world, via the Nine Network Australia, through Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane, Darwin, Perth, Adelaide and Hobart, welcome to your weekly dose of Kakarama with Dan's the Dope, the Dick and the Gang on Hey, Hey, it's Saturday. Summers, could I just think, you know last week when I had to put my stick on camera and I said it was felt pretty cold? Oh yes. Guess what? Well we said a stick warmer might be in Oh yeah, a whole lot of the girls sent some stick warmers in, some dicky warmers. I thought oh. you might like to see one. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I'm not wearing this one at the moment. Hold it's it, you take your head down so we can <laughs> see the... Hold it right up, Dickie. Yeah. Hold I'll, it up. There we are. Hold it up higher, Dickie. Yeah. Uh, turn turn the pretty part Yeah, that's around. me lying, oh. yeah. Isn't that nice? That's me lying flat in me back right now. Were you, were you measured for that? Pardon? Were you measured No, the that? girls just guessed, Mr. Oh, Ross. Yeah, yeah. No, and I've got, yeah. got a big one here. Have yeah. you so, really? Yeah, I think they got it mixed up, a big black one. Oh, right. This is for my Uncle Joel. Oh, oh. Jolney. Yeah, that's right. Jolney. Jolney. Well, thank you, thank you Jolney. girls, for sending them in. And oh, very, nice. very nice indeed. Oh, I see you. Oh, they're everywhere. Oh, they're oh my goodness. Oh, they boy, they're everywhere. They've gone oh, over the got top, haven't they? Yeah, yes. I'm having great fun. I tried one on every one to? Oh, I, oh, I mean, oh, oh, no. Oh. Oh. 
<laughs> oh, Luna Park. Brethren, <laughs> we are gathered here today. We are gathered here today to join this man, <laughs> David Gray, to his lovely bride, Christine. Oh, sorry, I was just. Christine. Christine Hogan. Christine Hogan. Christine Hogan. Christine Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a spin-off from the Knob Act. Oh, look. Hey, look, you just use a pencil. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Call the thing over and I'll draw on it. Do you want now, to? this really works. See, the pencil loosens the... loosens the biz up. That, all right. Doesn't it, Johnny? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I've never done it to him before. before. <laughs> How's it feeling? <laughs> I hope there's some lead in the oh, pencil. Oh, yeah, the soap. Soap always works. Does it? Yeah, oh. I'll have it. There's a good pen. So, haven't you ever used soap? Yes. <laughs> I'm not on my. No, I, I, mean, I never we, have. Where oh, did right, you get well, all these remedies? Uh, oh. Uh, oh, sorry. How's that? Oh, it's friends. Is it still. Oh, hang on, hang on. Maybe it needs this sort of soap here. Hey, hey, it's Saturday. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Oh, I'm not. Oh. Sorry. Well, we've got a million lines and can't use any of them, folks. Rely on this. I don't want to make a mess. Get on that quick. Quick line, we haven't got all day. What do you think about these pliers? Oh, you're joking. Oh, okay. Okay, I know this is a never failer. The old candle. What are you doing? What are you doing? I promise you, my mother. My mother always uses a candle. Okay. Rub it on your zipper. Yeah, I you wouldn't. Rub it on your zipper. I wouldn't turn that way, Daryl. Yeah, rub it on your zipper. Why? Looks a bit like. I know, I know. Looks a bit like interval at the Barrel yeah, Cinema. Work. We can't do that. Ah, that's oh. it. <laughs> right. Give it a pull. <laughs> no good. No good. Oh, look, well, oh wait, wait, Daggy, yeah. lie down. I know what to We're... do. Here. You do this, it won't oh. absolutely everything else fails. Not the hook. You hook a hook into it, and then you start up the car, and it'll definitely pull, pull it off. Kind of our show is kind of like, and the only thing we can come up with is Saturday Night Live, but it's yeah. really not quite like Saturday no, Night Live. No, no, no. Your show is more for uh, small children and animals. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah, you know, I heard that. It's a small child. There, hey, there were the animals in shop there. How you there. going, chibi baby? This is, <laughs> this is Dickie Knee. Hey, nice you, to meet you, Dick. How you doing? Nice to meet yours as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you did, uh, there wouldn't be any room in here for you. <laughs> Uh, I know you weren't going to perform or anything, but I wondered whether I could lay it on you to uh, just do a little, at least something of Lady as a Tramp, because it's one of your big hits, Lady as a, as a Tramp. There's Girl Talk, there's a whole heap of others, but this would be great. I think We'd it'd be, be wonderful. Let's have some All right, fun. yeah, yeah Buddy Wrecker. Hey, do, uh, um, what key uh, for Lady as a Tramp? Uh, B flat. B flat. Come over here, buddy. Uh, Come yeah. over here. Go. Okay. She gets too hungry. All right. For dinner at eight. Yeah. Hates the theater. And never comes late. You know what? She never bothers with the people she hates. Now that's why, that's why the lady is a tramp. You got it. Won't go to crap games <laughs> with barons and earls. 
Won't, what's the other one? Won't go to Harlem. Won't go to Harlem in her mind and her. Right. Won't dish won't the dirt. Dish the dirt. Thank you. For the rest of the girl. What's the name of the song? That's why the lady is a tramp. Take the break. She loves the freak. Fresh yeah. wind in her hair. You know what? Life without care. She's flat. And that's that. Hey, it's California. No, Johnny! Hey. It's oh, cold and it's damp. damp. <laughs> that's why the lady is a tramp. Yeah! She loves the free, fresh wind. Who is that in her hair? Life without care. She's so And that's so. Hey, it's California. It's cold, cold and it's damp. That's why the lady. That's why the lady. the report card that said could be a good student if they applied themselves more but one group of class clowns kept up their irreverent attitude through high school university and made it into a career on television when they started out they called themselves the degeneration steady a few more left yeah how's that look oh beautiful sounds clear check great okay oh, we're just about to begin let's go through the checklist uh donuts check uh beers check uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, the complete works of William Shakespeare, check. Uh, the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Barber, check. Check it works. Let's give it a bash, eh? Go, 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 go. Over here, quick. Put this in your ear. You've got to hear everything we say through that thing there, okay? And we'll be talking to you through this. You'll be getting all the answers, right? Straight up. Firstly, just want to go through a couple of things with you. Andrew Denton, he's a little twerk. Well, forget him, okay? Marty Putz, he's nuts, okay? okay. Forget Mark, you know, so don't worry about that. You can't lose, okay? Uh, now, just before we go, Tony wants a quick word. Janie, key word, anticipation. What is the highest mountain in? That's when you press your button. He'll say to you, no food you. Anything to do with the highest office solar in the world is either going to be a pope or a president. Yeah. And very important, they hardly ever oh, put the yeah. big money behind the home viewer. Don't go. Don't go. One last thing, don't call Gwen Tony. Okay. Good luck. Bye. Okay, boys, here we go. Battle stations. Tony, done it. So we're going to get into the serious side now. We'll see you in the gift shop. Question one: Why did the chicken cross? Jane. To get to the other side. Well, yeah, you're going to accept that. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Go on, go to it. Tell them not to get too cocky. Focus, focus. Focus, don't get cocky. Over uh, the game of cards, to be successful or perform well is to come up what? A uh, uh, fish. No, 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 snap, snap, snap. snap. Uno, Trumps, Uno. Trumps, 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 Trumps. 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 That's right, in the lead by Trumps. Cool. Yeah. Right, Jane, are you buying for your home viewer at the moment? Okay, so we want $6, I'll bring it down to $4. Don't buy. Barter, barter. 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 Everyone buys for $4, so going one. I'll take three, three, three. that's will take now the scores now, Andrew on 50. Hey Jane, Mick Riggins you want to sleep with Glenn Ridge, is that true? Is it? My brother-in-law. Oh, that's great, yeah. Do you be nice? what are you doing? We're back on. Mate, I'm ordering dinner, I'm hungry. Now what do you want? It's Indian. I've got uh, two samosas so far, a uh, chicken vindaloo. Papa Dumps. Papa Dumps. Hey Jane. Papa Dumps. No. <laughs> Now, I'm going 50, so Jane's going 50, 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 Jane's is a what zone? Erogenous zone. Erogenous zone. Erogenous zone? What's that? You know, it's a little pleasure spot. You know, remember, I've got one right there. Touch that. Right there. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so according to the nursery rhyme, old King Cole was a what? Silly old fart! Merry old soul. Merry old soul. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's how many pages take six couplets. Andrew. Enough. 
James, thank you for joining us. For your home viewer, you've won. Get Joe Bailey's phone number. Get Joe Bailey's phone number. Take it. Get, get Joe Bailey's phone number. Oh, she didn't get Joe Bailey's phone number. So, uh, you wouldn't have Joe Bailey's phone number? No, no, sorry. No, no. Victoria Nichols? No. How about Joe Bandolini? Mm. Elise Platt? Mm. Who's one? Barbie Rogers. Barbie who? Oh, here's trouble. Oh, watch out, Tony. She goes right on. Absolutely pathetic effort that Ooh. was. You guys knew how much I wanted to win. That lot of good you were, Barber. Here. <laughs> oh, great. I haven't got this thing. I don't think it's exactly about making people laugh in a sense in that you, you're you really deep down trying to, probably trying to amuse yourself. Mm. You, you're trying to piss fart around, mm. really. And it's, and it's the enjoyment of that that you spin off into thinking, well, I can actually do this in a, mm. in a public environment and not get arrested for it. So you think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll push it through. But I, I reckon if, if we were to be honest the way we do it, it's always been about sitting in a room and thinking up an idea and enjoying that moment. Mm. The actual execution of it is probably a bit too it's, tedious. This formality you've got to go through after that. But yes, Rob mm. says we like amusing ourselves and amusing each other. That's kind of our motivation. And so we're a good sort of guide. But um, I also think one of the features is that we did kind of sneak into this accidentally. I mean, I, I get letters, I'm sure Rob does too, from oh, I want to be in comedy, I want to write comedy, and I really want to do... And we never kind of went through that phase. It was, it was all just an accident, a bit of a hobby at, at uni that got a little bit out of hand and, and has carried on since then. So, and, you know, even every now and then we stop and go, oh my God, we're still doing this 12 years down the track. He's got him. He's got the beauty. Well done, Nick. Well done. Yeah. Oh, well done. Good <laughs> class, too. Yeah. Where'd you get it from? Uh, borrowed it. <laughs> borrowed it. What do you mean you borrowed it? Excuse me one second. Come on, kids. Come on, we have to walk from here. Off you go. Straight home now. Come on, you know the rules. <laughs> Little tackers. <laughs> Rob, uh, what are you doing now? Uh, dimensional work, Tommy. Dimensional work. That's what it's called in the tray. We're actually trying to work out the exact distances that the buses have to be apart. Well, this looks like where the first one should be, Mickey. So put the stake in, and we'll see how. We <laughs> Of you. But, do you realise you did something wrong then? What was it? The mist. Okay, let's get this measured. You hang on to that. Okay, Nikki. Okay, let's just see how far we've... What's the uh, stunt actually for, Rob? It's uh, for a new series in Australia called On the Buses Down Under. Uh -huh. Of course, Reg Varney's deceased, so his part will be played by... A Grant Doddle. Oh, right. Mm. And how far from the buses now do we have to be? I'll just check. How far is that, Mick? Uh, about a foot and a half. <laughs> How's it going, Rob? Good, good. The uh, weather's not on our side, but uh, you know, there's an old saying in the stunt game. What is it? Oh, I can't remember it now. It's, there is an old saying. It's, uh, it's about the weather, I think. And uh, where's Mick? Oh, he's fine-tuning some of the details. I mean, there's a lot on his plate. Hey, Robbie, but... look, it's the Partridge family bus, and I'm Reuben Kincaid. <laughs> Tracy, come on, everybody, get happy. <laughs> Tell me, reverse right, Mickey. Oh. Stop moving, right? There you go, Robbie. A double granny. Good. He's an expert on knots. He's, uh... You just stand back a second, Mickey. since you've rung your mother. You've got it, you've got to teach them the right word. Because Rob, who will be driving the second bus? Um, I'm not sure actually. Mick's organised somebody. Who have you organised, Mick? Uh, my little brother, Herb. <laughs> you ready, Mick? OK, come on, come on. No time to... Uh... Around. There's a window of opportunity as we call it in some game. You're not gonna wear gloves, Rob? I'm not a, I'm not afraid of rope burn, I'm afraid of having my arms ripped off. Okay, you ready, Mick? Here we go, Robbie! You ready, huh? Okay, Robbie! Go! What do 
you think of the uh, guy winning the beauty contest in Queensland? I thought it was great. I don't know. I think he did very well. He should have won. Why yeah. shouldn't he? I think uh... <laughs> Beyond good, as far as I'm concerned, he's not a guy. That's all I can say. He's... He shouldn't have won because he's ugly. <laughs> well, what do you think? They're going on competition and further. They're going on competition further. Are he going on competition further? <laughs> mm, I thought it was ridiculous. Yeah, you don't think he's a potential Miss Australia? No, I don't think he's a potential... <laughs> I think the guy was fantastic. I mean, he's got balls, hasn't he? Yes. Apparently, and that seems to be the, the thing I'm having. As a judge in one of those competitions, what do you think they'd be looking for in, in, a, in a man? What sort of qualities? Oh, I reckon um, well, sensitivity, intelligence, uh, you know, um, perhaps... Enormous testicles? <laughs> Could be. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> These silicon implants, Tony. <laughs> Hey, look, everything is original. Did you see the guy on television who won the beauty contest up in Queensland? Sir, so, do you realise you've got a kid attached to the back of your head? <laughs> this can be surgically removed, you realise? Any chance of uh, removing the kid so I can have a go? <laughs> Come on, let us have a ride. And what about, say, Mickey here? Would you vote for him? If you had a wash, maybe. If you had a shave, you might, yeah. <laughs> you don't think that a beauty contest is necessarily uh, an artistic All pursuit? All are beautiful. Really? Yeah. Even, even me? Darling, you're shocking, but you're not, yeah. You know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry, Nick, sorry about that. Sorry, man. Welcome back to Australian TV's Funniest People. Max Gilly started out in the industry as an actor, but he soon used those talents in the field of comedy when he turned to political satire. Supported by a group of able comedians, he made The Gillies Report a huge success. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Bob Hawke was really just one of many characters that I played, but I guess um, for a number of reasons he became the most popular. He was the most popular politician, certainly the most popular Prime Minister we'd ever had at the height of his popularity. He was extraordinarily popular. And, and of course, as an actor, he was a, he was a godsend. If we, if we all agree in this great nation, there's not going to be anything to bloody argue about, it. <laughs> That's politics, you know. I'll tell you what, though, sometimes I feel I'd rather be in your line of business and entertainment. <laughs> Uh, politics is full of uh, bloody prima donnas, mate. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, if you're in yeah. my game, you wouldn't get as paid as much as you do in yours. <laughs> you're, you're joking. <laughs> Don't be joking. This is a broadcast on behalf of the Australian Labor Party for the state election. The speaker is Max Gillies. G'day. I'm a Victorian, same as you. A great place to live. Of course, it gets a bit nippy in winter. I'm an ordinary bloke. Like me footy. Got a footy team. Like me beer, got a brewery. But like everyone else, I like to get up north from time to time. Got a nice little weekend in the south of France. And I like a party. Got one of those too. Sometimes what made the, the sketch work was a, uh, was a combination of the production elements and the script and hopefully the performance. And sometimes I'd be playing multiple characters in the one frame. And when, when that worked at its best, it, it was pure magic. And I remember very fondly a, a piece we did about the dismissal of the Whitlam government. And there's a moment in that where uh, Malcolm Fraser's 
lying on a bed, wondering how he's going to get Whitlam out. And um, Sir John Kerr, the Governor General, pops up, he's been in the bed too, and he pops up and they sing a duet together. Be more sad up, I will begin up. Damn it's the slumbers, I'll get the numbers. Can you block supply? Would I tell a lie? Lost the rear is through. Well, out of the revenue. Coup d'etat, coup d'etat. Labour is in the pool. Yes, they are. Completely stuffed by you. I was very lucky to have John Clark working on the Gillies report with me because I think he's one of the uh, he's he's unique he's he's, uh, he's one of the funniest people in the world and uh, at the time we did the Gillies Republic he wasn't all that well known in Australia he'd uh, he'd had a big career already in New Zealand um, but he'd come to Australia and he he really wanted to lead a quieter life Mr. Scase, thanks for getting into the studio. I'm not in the studio in any financial way. I'm only in here to talk to you. I've got no involvement with it. Are you coming back to Australia? Very much like to come back there. I remember Australia very fondly, of course. I have photographs of it all over the house. Where are you living at the moment? Well, you know those little tumble-down old mission houses you often find near the industrial waste section of some of the older European cities? Sure. Well, I live in a 400-room mansion overlooking that. And how do you live? Very nicely, thank you. No, I mean, how do you pay for it all? I'd like to thank the Australian taxpayer while I have the opportunity. I haven't run up a formal speech and I haven't spoken about the matter for some time, but I understand there's a recession back there and I, this is absolutely fantastic over here. This is beyond my expectation. What sort of uh, general day do you have over there? Well, take today. I got up around 10, 10.30, little crushed orange juice on the terrace, wandered down to the exquisite little town. They just pull the garfish straight up out of the sea and pop them on the burner, stand a handful of that and you're ready for coffee. And then I normally slip under a sun umbrella and have a little kip with the Guardian Weekly over my face for 40. What's the time there now? It's just about opening time here now. What, you're going for a drink? No, the banks are nearly open. Nearly time for the banks to open. What do you do down there at the banks? Well, a few of the boys and I go down the bank for a laugh in the morning. Have a bit of a laugh over here. It's very funny. Uh, Mr Scase, what about this inquiry back here? Will you be coming back to answer questions? Uh, well, not immediately. Uh, I can't travel, unfortunately, at the moment. Why not? Uh, well, I'm having laser treatment for a bad back. What exactly is the problem with your back? I don't know yet. The bloke with the laser's not here. You mean he's actually going to give you a back problem? Well, we think it'll be a back problem. You can get a leg problem, and as a matter of fact, I have my name down for a cork thigh at one stage, but we think we'll go for back. Do you uh, intend to come back here and answer questions at any point? Do I intend to leave this country, which has no extradition arrangement with Australia, and come back there and answer a lot of questions from a barrister in the witness box about where the 200 million went? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Soon as possible. Soon as the back clears up. Well, when will you be coming back? Just a minute. Excuse me. The bank's open. Pardon? We'll just send someone down there to laugh. Tell them I'll be there shortly. I'll just see this guy off. Sorry. When will you be coming back? Is Bob Hawke still the Prime Minister there? Yes, he is. He's not, is he really? Yes, he still. is. Still? Who's yes. the opposition? Uh, the Liberals. <laughs> oh, you're joking. No, no, they're in Really? Power. Get a deposit slip. You can still do it. Mr Scase, uh, the, the satellite's running out. Thanks for joining us. I'm not joining you, son. You do have the opportunity to say something if you notice something that's particularly annoying or totally ridiculous or an obvious lie. Um, it sometimes is uh, 